The scripture reading for today is Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I'd like to invite um, Pastor Steve Chris. Um, to come up and give the sermon. The Lord's blessings upon you. One too many layers of things on my ears, my glasses, my mask, and my mic. Let's see, I had this all set perfect. There we go. I think I'm set. It's uh, good to be here with you this Sunday, and I bring you greetings from the 8,500 of us who are from Mosaic Mennonite Conference. Uh, And uh, I think this is the first time that I am in a preaching role here with you at Boyertown. That's why I was trying to remember, Nelson. When was I here last? I was here, but it was, I wonder if I was in the exec min role yet. Was it about four years ago? So I think it's the first time I'm in the exec min role, and it is definitely the first time that I preached here with you uh, as executive minister of Mosaic Conference. Man, me and this thing today. Let's see. Let me give myself some more space. All right, I'm going to get away from the other mic. Maybe that'll make me less distracted. So, uh, so I just bring you greetings. One of the things I try to do is bring greetings from the place I was the most recently in my role. And this last Sunday, I was actually at my home congregation, Philadelphia Praise Center, which is one of our South Philadelphia congregations, and celebrating the licensing of Emmanuel uh, Villatoro. And Emmanuel is, uh, was part of the Nueva Vida Norristown New Life congregation, grew up in Guatemala, and was called into a youth ministry role in South Philadelphia. So he and his wife, Jenna, who works for Mennonite Central Committee East Coast, relocated to South Philly to work with not Spanish-speaking youth, which is interesting, uh, but uh, Indonesian-speaking youth. So Emmanuel and Jenna are are working with a burgeoning South Philly youth group uh, that they admitted last Sunday has grown rapidly uh, during the pandemic. Uh, And so we know that many things have happened during the pandemic, and some of them are surprises. Uh, And so some of them have been difficult, but sometimes they're surprises. And in this particular situation, uh, a number of Indonesian families have relocated to South Philly due to the economic turbulence, which has meant more uh, youth. I uh, also want to remind you, uh, if you are a delegate to Mosaic Conference, This is my administrative mindset. That is Nelson, I think Greg, uh, and maybe Barb. Anyone else? Yes, there are three. Uh, There's at least three of you here, usually. Just a reminder to register this week. Uh, Our annual conference assembly is virtual uh, this this time again, unfortunately. Uh, However, we made that decision knowing the numbers were sketchy and knowing kind of what I said to uh, folks this morning that when we are commingling from many different parts of the country at this point, that it creates a little bit of a higher level of risk. Uh, and we wanted everyone to really be able to participate. So we went virtual again. So I know I'm pretty Zoom fatigued, uh, but hopefully it will be a good time to be together. And if you are not a delegate, you're invited to join the virtual worship as well. Uh, there is a watch party. The closest one to you that I know of right now is at Southerton Mennonite. So you could show up at Southerton Mennonite uh, and watch the video. 
uh, of the live worship, which is being held at another meeting house, which I can't tell you where. Uh, but as soon as you watch it, some of you will know where it's at. So, uh, so we're trying to discourage people from showing up at that location, but showing up at the other location. So if you're interested in going to Allentown uh, and hanging out with, uh, with folks that work with Danilo at Ripple Community Inc., they are also the living room location for the Lehigh Valley. So either of those locations, Satterton Mennonite or at Ripple Community Inc. in Allentown, you can go. There'll be snacks and you can watch the video uh, of worship, uh, live worship being broadcast from an undisclosed location in Pennsylvania. The text for today, uh, actually Lee read for you just part of the text. Uh, and I think Nelson decided you didn't need the full chapter. I gave him that option. But I'm going to preach the whole chapter. So hopefully your lunch is in a crock pot. No one found that particularly humorous. So, uh, Thanks, Nelson. <laughs> so I'm going to preach through the whole chapter today. It's a shorter chapter, uh, but it's a chapter. One of the things I've been doing from my role as executive minister has been trying to pay attention to particular texts that I think might be important to us as a community at this time. So admittedly, I've preached this in several of our congregations before this fall, but it continues to evolve as I'm continuing to work with it and to change and sort of what I'm paying attention to in different settings. So this Luke 15 text is very interesting to me because of some of the very first verses that Lee read. Uh, and Lee reminded me just this morning that kind of previous to this is the Zacchaeus in a tree story. So we, if we were really, uh, if I was really into making sure you were awake, I might have a sing and do the motions to that song that goes with it. But we're going to skip that for today. But remember, right before that chapter, Dr. Luke reminds us that story. And then we go into another set of things here that I really want to have you pay attention to. And if, it's in, if you have the message, does anyone have the message version with you this morning? It is my favorite interpretation of this. I can tell you what it says. Uh, because it says something here that I love the alliteration, the shared words. It says in those early texts, the religious leaders were growling and grumbling. Oh, growling and grumbling. This is, to be honest with you, this is the piece of the text that was the most interesting to me. Because we definitely live in a time where religious leaders are growling and grumbling. It is not a good look for us. I'll just be blunt. It is not a good look for us as religious leaders to be as growling and grumbling as we are. It has been a difficult time for everyone, whether it's politics, whether it's racism, whether it's pandemic, whether it's economics, this has not been an easy stretch of time. And many of us, religious persons and religious leaders, we have been growly and grumbly. Growly about the election, growly about uh, protests, growling about masks, growling about not masks, growling about the China virus, growling about everything, even in the ways that we name things. This has not been a good look for us. And so I find Jesus' stories here to be really helpful for us. Now I know the religious leaders there are growling and grumbling about a particular thing. I'm actually not quite as fascinated by that particular thing. We know they're kind of irritated about who Jesus is spending time in. If you want to talk about that, we can afterwards. But I really want stories. Three critical stories. So I want to have you look at the text. Lee read the first one. Nelson, we can go to the first picture here. And I want to talk a little bit more about a growling and grumbling context. Let's see how well you all are engaged with news from the summer. Does anyone recognize this pic? You know where it's at? You don't have to be exact, but... Exactly. It, Greg, do you want to add to it? It's in a cargo plane, right? And this is a flight out of Kabul, and I think it is going to Qatar. It is packed full of people. What we remember at this particular time, in a time of growling and grumbling in our country about just how this whole process was going, in the meantime, people were fighting for their possible existence. 
in Kabul. And we felt our hearts tugged no matter the side of our politics. It is one of the first times in our period of growling and grumbling that we all seem to be on the same page of saying what is happening here is pretty awful to watch. And so the thing I love about this picture is to get behind the scenes, and there's a couple of behind the scenes of this picture, is that the people who were flying this plane were not expecting to pick up 600 people in Kabul. They made a decision on the ground, the flight crew, to allow people in. I want to think about those kind of people. I want us to be those kind of people that make those kind of decisions, to think about the situation in front of us has changed, and it might be pretty awful. But here is a way, in a moment, that what might be lost might be found with the resources that I have access to. This is not all pretty. What we also know about this particular flight is it may have well been the flight where we saw people fall off of an aircraft who hoped to get in. It was not perfect. Were these folks well screened? Probably not. But the amount of energy that I want us to draw our attention to in the midst of growling and grumbling, in the midst of a lot of confusing, was a capacity to make a decision to do the best that we could with the resources that we had so that those who might be lost could possibly be found. I'm going to head to the next slide, Nelson. This slide hits us directly at the text that Lee read. And the story here is an interesting one to me, and it's one that I've been convicted on more and more as I look at the text. It is the story of the 99 secure and the one that is lost, right? That is such a frustrating management system. Leading a community of 8,500 8, people, one of the things I sometimes find myself saying is, I don't have energy for one particular person's disgruntlement. That is not the story that Jesus is telling us, which is annoying. The story that Jesus is reminding us is that the shepherd attends well enough to the whole to know when the one is missing, and to not blame the missing one for its missingness. Isn't this interesting? There is not a lot of commentary. Why were you so dumb to get away from the rest of the flock? Were you daydreaming? Were you on your phone? Was this intentional? What is wrong with you, sheep that is not with the rest of us? It's interesting. The shepherd asks none of those questions. There is no evidence of grumbling, no evidence of growling, just the resolution that some sheep has wandered off. Now, maybe the grumbling was internal, but the shepherd's relationship with the other 99 is secure enough to go find the other one. I'm fascinated by that. Because often what we attend to is the problem of the one. Why can't that single one person be like the rest of us who are gathered here today, faithful, showing up, getting up early, deciding whether to deal with masks, deciding whether to deal with the pandemic, however. But Jesus' attention in the story is focused on the one. That's pretty humbling to me. I think about who that one person is. Is that one person someone whose life does not quite fit together, who takes a lot of energy, who struggled with addictions, who hasn't found their way, who's found themselves in a precarious spot? You know, I imagine 
that when you're a shepherd, I'm never, I don't really have a, I don't know much about sheep. I've had this conversation with other people with sheep about sheep sometimes. And it's this, this morning out of Philadelphia, there's a preserved area. And I love this farm. It's sheep. This morning, the sun was nice. They all look happy. But I think about, we talk about in the Middle East, one missing sheep. Often that person is isolated and more vulnerable to attack by wolves. Or may have found itself into a precarious spot somewhere in a rocky ledge where it can't quite get itself negotiated out. This is a total sideline. One time I was in Colorado and all of a sudden this flock of things came out of the mountains. Flock of things, that's not even the right word, but you know what I mean. And I said, oh, are those mountain goats? No, actually they're bighorn sheep. Just a reminder that sometimes we can't even really quickly tell the difference between sheep and goats. The energy of finding the one. In a culture of grumbling and growling, Jesus reminds us that it is an invitation to spend energy on the one. That might mean working through a relationship that's difficult. That might mean accompanying someone who has found themselves in a precarious spot. That might mean uh, not showing up on a Sunday morning because someone needs attended to. I was at Jim and Anna Ralph's retirement party last night, and I was reminded of this. Because Jim's mom is 95 and can't go away from the house, Anna stays home with Jim's mom and has for three years during Sunday worship so he can be present. The value of the one. We pursue the one because Jesus also pursued the one. Next section of Luke. This story is about a woman, and this is my image of her. I really like this. I've landed on this one. She has lost what would be the equivalent of about a $50 bill to a $100 bill somewhere in her house. Enough that you're going to tear some stuff up. Now, if it's a nickel, most likely you're going to chill until that nickel shows up or forget about it. But she's lost roughly an equivalent at the time of a day's wage. And she's become aware of it. I have a lot of questions about why she's become aware of it. Was it the end of the month? Social Security? She ran out. EBT card no longer worked at Redner's. Rent was needed to be paid. She needed to buy a birthday gift. There's some kind of recognition of need in this story. She has lost this day's labor. What I want you to notice about this is that we celebrate this woman's work of finding it. The two things in this story is there is work to do, right? And the first one there is the desire to go after the one. And in this story, there is a desire to find the resource that has been lost so that it can be used to the fullness of its purpose. I want you to notice something again. There is no judgment on this woman for having lost her money. None. I'm fascinated by the sequence of those two things. I think your mom might say that. <laughs> this is enough money that you should kind of know where it's at. Or did you not spend your money well this month, right? Did you buy too much chocolate on that EBT card? Or were you hoarding toilet paper because you were afraid of a new shortage? There is no judgment on her for lo having lost this money and being at this point. I want us to be those kind of people. I want us to be her and the people that hear this story. She tears the house apart. And I want you to notice what she does with it afterwards. She tells her neighbors about this experience. 
look, I lost $100 and I found it again. That's the thing. Nelson and June aren't embarrassed to tell you the dumb thing that they just did. Or irresponsible thing, possibly in your opinion. And they're not afraid to tell you that it's the end of the month and I thought maybe I couldn't make it. And I need to scour the house to find this last $50 bill to pay the rent. She was not afraid. Instead, notice the sequence in the stories. There is rejoicing. In the first story, there is rejoicing because the lost is found. In the second story, there is rejoicing because the thing that we thought had been lost is restored. And notice what she does with it. Middle Eastern culture, there is no celebration without food. She calls the neighbors in to celebrate. She breaks that $100 bill. Probably goes and gets some tea. Maybe some pita bread. The thing that I thought I had lost, I have found. And I'm going to invite you here for a snack. I'm going to spend part of it, possibly, on you. This is way cooler than grousing and grumbling. I want to be that kind of person. Honest, celebratory, open-handed. Even when I'm afraid, I don't have enough resources at the end of the month. Next story is the most complicated of the three. And it is, in church settings, the one that is sometimes hardest to figure out who we identify with. Back when I pastored in Western Pennsylvania in my homeland of Somerset County, I had a Sunday school class separate on who they identified with in the story, to the left and to the right. Are you the faithful child that stayed home or are you the wanderer? This is a Mennonite congregation, not unlike Boyertown. Where do you think most people stayed? Where do you think most people landed? They were the ones that stayed home. They were the faithful son in the prodigal son story. So I want us to pay attention here to this story just in a different way. You can take a look. I'm not going to read the text directly today because that will take us a little bit too long. You can look at it in front of you. But we understand the story is that a young man asks for his inheritance from his dad, basically says, Dad, I want to pretend that you're dead already, and I want everything that I deserve. Okay. Crazy thing in the story, again, is amazing centeredness of the dad. All right. I don't know what your deal is, dude. But here, go have your rum springer. And I'll pay for it. The thing I want us to pay attention to is that the dad never stops waiting for the son to return. It says he recognizes him from afar off when he comes back. And the son goes through all kinds of nonsense. Goes and finds himself actually feeding pigs. And we all know that sort of in Jewish tradition, this is probably the worst assignment you can have. And he's eating the food that the pigs are eating. It's unclean. It's table scraps. So he finds himself in this most weirdly awful situation and manages the thing that he knows about his dad already is that seemingly his dad was centered enough to give him whatever he asked for. He might be gracious enough to let him come back at least eat with other people that work on the farm. There is something about the knowledge of who that guy was as a parent that made all of this possible both the leaving and the returning. So in the story, the father is, interestingly, recognizes the son from afar off. 
What I want to think about in this story is that the son is coming back looking pretty different. He may have left dressed very nicely in his Sunday church clothes, but he's coming back in a hoodie and hasn't shaved for a while. He maybe has on sweats. But the dad recognizes him. Thinking about that kind of posture of being able to recognize and wait and anticipate and recognize and love a person who is returning or a person who is lost and recognizing them as someone who belongs rather, again, than grousing and grumbling. There's welcome. There's celebration. Let us kill the fatted calf. Remember, he's been eating badly. This is not just kill the fatted calf because you had a nice McDonald's meal yesterday. This is different. He hadn't eat, eaten well. And in the Middle Eastern culture, again, we recognize that this is how you celebrate communion, how you celebrate relationship, was by table. So the person in this story who grouses and grumbles is the faithful son. Man, you do not want to be the grouser and grumbler in this story. I'm just going to tell you. You do not, does not play out well for you later. We have 2,000 years of history. We know that. The centeredness of the father is the amazing piece to me in the story because he is again open-handed to the grouser and grumbler. You know how much time I have a lot right now for grousing and grumbling? About zero. It is hard for everybody. The father says to him simply, I want you to join the celebration. He says, everything that I have is yours. He doesn't force him. He only invites and doesn't validate the grousing and grumbling. Pay attention to that. Instead, turns the story around. What I notice in this sequence of things that I think is important for us in a time of grousing and grumbling is to pay attention to what is lost and to pay attention when it is maybe us who are lost. Whether we are the one who has run off to a far land and are barely recognizable, or we are the grouser and grumbler sitting in the pew. To recognize the invitation to do our work. In all three of the stories, there was work to be done a sheep to be found, risks to be taken, a thorough house cleaning. Notice the, the word choice is intentional. A thorough house cleaning of our own. And a readiness to celebrate for those who might have been lost to come back home, to find a place to belong. There is work to do, and there is a celebration to be had, and a recognition that we, at times, are both the lost and the found, those who are seeking and those for whom God is seeking. Today, my sisters and brothers at Boratown, may we be those people of rejoicing when we do our work. May we share what we have open-handedly and honestly. And may we be able to celebrate, rejoice in the God who has created us, waits for us, invites us, accompanies us, invites us to be centered enough to be part of his seeking of others waiting to come home. In the way of Jesus, may we live this. Amen.